Hello, Art Historians, and welcome to the second lecture over 20th century art. And when we last left our story, we were talking about the Expressionists. So we were talking about the way that after the 1800s, we start to see artists start to experiment a little bit more with color, um, kind of the same way that we saw the Post-Impressionists and the Impressionists doing it at the end of the 1800s. So we looked at Matisse, we looked at um, the, and who was a Favist, and then we looked at the Expressionists in Germany who were using color for expressive reasons, and we looked at De Brucke, which is the bridge, with Ernst Kirchner, and we looked at Kandinsky, who was the blue writer. So before you move on, take a second and consider these two questions, which focus on the compare and the contrast skill, and just shoot me an email or send me a remind considering these questions. It kind of gets get you to go back and think about what we looked at in our last lecture. All right, so we are now, in terms of history, we are entering that period of right at the end of World War I, getting into World War, the time between the wars, okay? So this work of art that we're looking right here, excuse me, let's make sure I didn't miss anything, um, is considered to be expressionist um, in the way that it uses the color in it, but the artist would have said, no, all right, they would have said that this doesn't actually, they weren't an expressionist, um, and this wasn't typically how they would do their work, um, but it turned out being in black and white because she was using a medium of wood printing at the time. And so I want you to take a second and see what works of art you may compare this to from ones that we've seen in the past. And I've had a lot of people who have said, maybe Goya, right, and the way that Goya uses in his war series of using black and white um, to kind of convey the innocence of the Spanish. And we're going to look at how they do use um, black and white in this piece, right? So this is actually a work done by Kathy Kalowitz, um, who was in Germany. Um, and I do want to make it very clear that even though she gets lumped in with the communists in Germany, she was not one, all right? She actually was... Um, a little bit more pro-socialist Nazi party than she was, but this figure that she actually ends up making the subject of this work um, was a communist, but she really supported it, um, just the way that he talked. All right, so I want to give you a little bit of a background to this. So when World War I ended, um, as you may remember, Germany was blamed for it. At the Treaty of Versailles, they had to sign a piece of paper that basically says this war was entirely our fault, we're responsible for paying for it, and the new German Republic, the Weimar Republic that they had created, their Kaiser or King had stepped down, um, was really struggling with how they were going to handle all of this. And within Germany, there were some groups who were rising up, and one of those groups was the Communist Party. So you had in Germany this conflict going on of the Nazi party who believes that there is a superior group. I mean, that's what they stand on, is that Germans are superior and people of German blood and what have you. And communists have this idea of equality and that completely clashes um, with that German Nazi idea. So there were often clashes, physical clashes in Germany between communists and people who were um, Nazi supporters. So Karl Liebknecht, all right, that is, shown here was actually a leader of a communist rebellion. So he was a communist supporter, he was a very communist um, speaker, and he led what was called the Spartacus Rebellion. And Spartacus was actually, um, from classical stories, he was a slave that had led a rebellion, and that's how the communists kind of viewed themselves under the government boot. And he was shot, and to the communist party, he came, kind of became a martyr. And Kathy Kalowitz, who is the artist who does this work, she wasn't a supporter of the Communist Party, but she did really speak to that. And if you'll notice here, nothing in this looks like it's communist. All right? It doesn't. There's nothing in there that's communist symbols. In fact, communism is associated with the color red. This is not. All right? It's just black and white and different shades of black and white. And that was deliberately done because this was speaking to human suffering as a whole. And what was going on in Germany was just another explanation of human suffering. And Mary, uh, or Kathy Kalowitz is a lot like Mary Cassatt, that she focused on a lot of her work on women and children. Um, because she, unlike Mary Cassatt, Kathy Kalowitz had lost a son. And she was devastated by that. So 
this idea of mothers and children and loss and loss of innocence and just the loss of humanity in general really, really spoke to her. And that's what this was about. Now, she uses a woodcut on purpose, like a woodcut print, like we've seen in the past, because that was a traditional German medium. Remember, we saw that with Albrecht Dürer, who used the engravings. We saw it with the Protestant Reformation, with Allegory of Law and Gospel. Printing developed in Germany with woodblock printing, or when it came to Europe anyway, because Asian cultures already had it. And it was kind of like the, the medium of the masses, if you will. It was cheap, it was quick, and it could be out there to people in a hurry. And that's what she was trying to do, was reach the common person because this was about the common person it was the communists and the common people rising up against what they felt was oppression so she was using the medium of the common people to speak to the common people so this is actually her quote about this and in 1919 so world war one has been over for just a little over a year and she said you know i was a political opponent but his death brought me closer to him later i read his letters which made his personality appear to me in the purest light so she wasn't a communist supporter but she got him and what she did if you'll notice is she it's all black and white and think about that it's whenever we say to somebody it's black and white it's it's clear it's one or the other right and it's just plain black and white this is what it is and it's human suffering and Karl Liebknecht's death was human suffering. And if you notice, she has people lamenting and weeping over him the way that we have seen people weeping or lamenting over Christ. All right. So whenever we've seen that in religious pictures, you see people mourning. You always see Mary Magdalene and Mary who are there mourning. So there's a woman in there. There's a baby, which is kind of like, you know, life and death. No matter what, you're still somebody's son, kind of like we've seen in the Pieta, that we're all humans, all right? This is loss, all right? It is just human loss. So why she puts it as that, as the lamentation, is it's something people would recognize as suffering and loss. Like humans are humans, whether it's Christ or it's this person, it's loss, and we all feel it the same idea. And this was about grief, not about politics. If it was politics, she'd put a communist symbol in it. But here he is draped in a white covering. And notice his face is in black, but the mourner's faces are in white. And there's one person over to the side just mourning like this because the emphasis needs to be on the grief that this causes. The dead are dead, but this is this, just this idea of human loss, all right? And people said, oh, well, she's an expressionist. She would say, no, she wasn't. All right. She's like, I'm not using black and white to particularly convey this particular idea. It does convey it, but it's more because it is the black and the white woodcut that is, it's black and white. It's here. The colors don't clash. They just accentuate each other to kind of convey this message of loss. And a lot of German artists will continue this. This is another Kathy Kollowitz right here of, you know, somebody with, you know, a two dead, an older and a young that loss is loss. All right. So now we're going to move into not just messing with color, but also messing with shape and form within the composition of a painting, because all of a sudden artists were freed. All right. It was we are no longer creating art to show a picture of something whether that's nature or a person or a historical scene artists were now creating art to create art it was art because of how it was made all right and we're going to start moving into cubism all right and cubism messes with the way that objects are shown on the canvas okay so before, right, if I was going to paint a person I, and I wanted to make it look naturalistic, I would stand in front of them and paint them because that's a viewpoint and that's all you would see from that viewpoint. All right, I'm not trying to show all sides of it. Cezanne, what he did is you can stand in one spot and see all the different angles of it. All right, all the geometric, everything has its own perspective. Cubism, I like this quote, is like standing at a certain point on a mountain and looking around, right? 
If you go higher, things are going to look different. If you go lower again, they'll look different. So basically what this is saying is you can't move around a painting. So they're going to bring the painting to you. They're going to show you all sides of it all at the same time. All right. So cubism, when we talk to cubism, we start talking about Pablo Picasso, but people frequently forget George de Brock, who was kind of like the alter ego to Pablo Picasso. Picasso loved attention. He was always out there. He was um, kind of a scandalous guy. Brock was very, very quiet. And these two guys had started working together before World War I and were kind of taking that idea of what everybody else was doing with color, these guys were doing with shape, right? They started worrying about more of how an art how art is made than rather what is shown it's not art because it looks naturalistic it's art because i can make it look unnaturalistic all right and i it's taken me a long time cubism seems so simple but it's taken me so long to wrap my brain around um but these guys give big tribute to paul cezanne because cezanne started this idea of showing one painting with different angles in it all right, so showing like all the perspectives of Mount St. Victoire at once, all right? Um, so these guys are like, I know that a mountain has different sides to it. I know that a person has a front, back, and a side. So why can't I show all of that at once? So here's kind of a difference between Cezanne and Picasso, all right? Cezanne helps you see all the different sides of this at the same time like he shows you that every single thing has its own shape and perspective all right picasso is going to do things a little bit different all right so there are actually multiple types of cubism believe it or not all right um because who knew there were so many ways to do different things all right so cezanne focuses on showing multiple viewpoints but still using perspective all right matisse doesn't show perspective cezanne was still trying to show perspective but show multiple perspectives at one time all right but you were still seeing the front of the object i, I know this is really hard to understand cubists like picasso are like think a cube has multiple sides all right when cezanne is painting he's still painting the one view the one side Picasso and the cubists are like, no, a cube has multiple sides to it. I want you to be able to see all of those sides at one time. So I'm going to break it apart and I'm going to show you all of the sides at one time. Okay. So I read somewhere this, the picture, a three-dimensional cup. So like, let's say I was holding this bottle of ibuprofen, which I need a lot of, right? And during the Renaissance, if I was going to paint this bottle of ibuprofen, right, I would put it on a table and you would stand in front of it or from some angle, right, and you would paint it losing, using linear perspective. You'd create depth by letting lines run to it, like the orthogonal lines and the horizon line. Great, right? Cezanne would try to take this, right, and show you, like if you're still standing in front, to show you all the viewpoints of looking at it from the front. So like if I stood over here, if I stood over here, if I stood over here, but I'm still looking at the front of the bottle, right? I'm just gonna show, Cezanne is gonna show you what that front of the bottle looks like if you were standing over there, over there, or over there. Picasso is gonna say, no, that bottle's got a back, a side, and a side. I'm gonna smash the bottle, and I'm gonna put all the pieces of the bottle where you can see them all at the same time, all at once, okay? So again, Renaissance and pretty much everything up to post-Impressionism, they're going to paint the front and all that you could see from where you were standing. All right, so you're not going to move. All right, Cezanne, I'm going to show you what it looks like from here, 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 and here. I'm going to show you what the front looks like. Picasso is going to show you the entire bottle all at the same time. Okay? So... Picasso is going to start what we call analytic cubism. All right, so analyzing this bottle of ibuprofen from all angles and showing it all at once. All right, but like I told you, Picasso likes to be a disturber. He's a little bit like Manet. 
All right. He likes to poke the bear. He likes to upset people to get their attention. All right. He does not like the Western tradition, the European way of showing objects. He's over it. He's done. All right. But if you're going to get people's attention, you have to do something old in a different way. Okay. He's like, we're, we're done with showing objects from one point perspective. That's what they mean when they say one point perspective. I'm standing here at this one point looking at that object, that person, or that scene. So what Picasso becomes famous for is Le Demoiselle de Avignon. All right, so we've got another French movement here. All right, even though it's, Picasso is Spanish, all right, so it doesn't really make a lot of sense, but okay. Basically, what he is painting here is a bunch of ladies of the evening from the red light district, right, um, in Avignon, which means basically a district for prostitutes. It's considered to be the first truly analytic cubist work, where it is a painting on oil, but um, he's analyzing it from all angles, all right? You can kind of see everything from all angles, which really upset people for a number of reasons, because you have Number one, we'd never seen this many nudes in a painting before. You got lots of them. The only thing that they're there for is nudity and to show their nudity. This one is actually taking her clothing off, if you can see that. Um, one is squatting. One is standing. He's showing new different ways of the nude. They're not laying down, all right? They're clearly standing up and advertising. And it wasn't soft. It was harsh and angular like basically turning the body into angles that can be viewed and he's like yeah yeah that's what i'm going for for sure all right so this was again prostitutes that were outside of a house of ill repute this probably shook people up even more than olympia did even though both of those nudes are set in modern times all right which is a kind of a different thing at the time He's not trying to go for perspective, one point perspective. He's trying to show you every angle of the women, front, back, side, and otherwise, all at the same time for them to be looked at. And people are like, oh my gosh, you're showing these prostitutes and all the parts of their body. And he's like, what do you think they're for? That's what they do, all right? You don't have a problem with them doing it. You just have a problem with me showing this, all right? It was the way he presented it like Manet, it's not soft. Manet uses those harsh blocks of colors that she doesn't look fleshy or soft, and neither do these. These look even sharper. And he used on their faces those styles of African masks, which are very geometric, but still they don't show the same features that African masks show of women, like humility or closed mouth, their eyes are open and looking at you. Um, and it was basically showing the primitive side of sex. Like this was, you know, basically saying that we are no better than savages who walk around with no tops on. Of course, we know better because African art was actually way more advanced than this, all right? There is, everything is pushed forward for you to look at. They're not far away from you, they're right here. And the background and the foreground and the sides and all of it are right there. And to give you an idea of who Picasso was, there's a quote from him. For me, there's only two kinds of women, goddesses and doormats. He puts them both together. We have a nude goddess, which we've seen before. We've seen it with Greek sculptures where they're holding a towel and they're coming out of the bath and all that. And then he's got doormats because they're prostitutes. And he's making it show that this is harsh and rough and he's showing every angle of their bodies in all different kinds of positions and it bothered people now this is something important to remember cubists are going to be kind of like other artists where to them the canvas is no longer just a background it's part of the art all right to these guys all right um it's the canvas isn't just something to be painted on all right it's a place from things to come out of, all right? So if you can make it clear that this, there's a flat background back here, that the canvas is flat, then it makes it even more impressive than it looks like these shapes are coming out at you, that it is cubist and there's shapes and angles who are almost like 
three-dimensionally rising off. And eventually the cubist will take it to another level and start working with like collage where things actually are three-dimensional on this and like have different textures to it. But cubists like to take an image and shatter it like with a, a hammer or something and show every side of it all at once and in a very geometric way like a cube like pieces that could eventually be put back together. if you have this ca this canvas that you make it clear there's a canvas there then it looks even cooler that this stuff is like coming off the canvas they wanted the canvas to be part of this so here we have a piece by George Brock right who is another cubist all right and he just was done with the ideas of perspective. He's like, I'm tired of us making look like something has depth because we go into it. Because think about Da Vinci's Last Supper. The lines all make you go into it and give it depth. Cubists want it coming out towards you. They want it to be looking like it's coming into your space so they can show all the sides of the image at once. They're trying to just break the rules coming out rather than going in. So Brock, I like to say, breaks it apart, all right? And this is called the Portuguese, all right? Which is supposed to be a person playing a guitar. Now Brock in 1911 is going to move into synthetic cubism, all right? And what I mean by that is he's going to make it very, very clear that there is a canvas underneath this because then it almost creates that feeling using those lines and geometric shapes that this is made of parts that are coming off the canvas, that all the parts of it, the front, the back, it's almost like you took an object like a Rubik's cube and put it on the canvas. That's what they want. So if you'll notice um, up here, there's nothing really about this that clearly makes it musical, like the Portuguese mus musicians. You can see some things that look like strings and you can see some things that kind of look like a guitar but that's not really what this is about. It's not about the object, it's about the form of it. So if you look up here on the sides at the very top, he stenciled letters onto this. They're not painted, he stenciled onto the canvas. And he did that to draw your attention to the fact that there is something underneath the shapes that he created with paint. So that way you're like, oh, there's a canvas under there and all these shapes are like, stacked and placed and like you can see every part of this all mixed up so it's a completely different way of creating this now cubism is actually going to be such a powerful powerful art movement that it's going to even influence photography all right because there had been this current moment in photography that as artists got freed up to do more experimenting and not just capture an image so did photographers they're like we want to do this too and there had been this movement in photography as photographers kept trying to assert that they were artists too there was a movement called pictorialism all right which was this idea of using basically the same things that artists do to create an image all right so creating different tones and creating different you know basically how they would develop the picture so if you look at this picture right here this one actually has four negatives that were done with it to create the diff the darker man the lighter girl um all of that so after that all right we start to see artists go well what if it was more impressive to just get that really good shot instead of having to manipulate it like this they almost go back the opposite direction and they're like what if we can do photorealism and it's just a great picture because of how we caught that picture and not how we developed it in the darkroom so the artist that we're going to look at for this is Alfred Stieglitz, right, who is an American photographer, or excuse me, he was working in America at the time, right? And America kind of had time during this point until 1917 to kind of play with these kind of art mediums because we weren't directly involved in World War I until 1917, all right? And Alfred Stieglitz is part of what we call the photo secessionist movement. And remember, secessionist is like breaking away right you secede like this the 
Confederacy wanted to secede and break away from the Union, all right, during the Civil War. And he kind of was like, okay, I think that we can just capture some amazing pictures because of the positioning of it, all right? And he believed that the works of photography that he was creating and other artists with him were just as impressive as what was going on in Europe. And he was like, I don't have to retouch it. I can just capture a really powerful image by the content that is in it. So it's kind of like that cubist idea of, it's not how, what it is, it's how it's done that makes it good, all right? So he was really inspired actually by artists like um, Pablo Picasso and this idea of lines and capturing multiple sides of an image. And that's why I love that they put this image on here because he captures so many sides of an image all at the same time. And it actually got lumped in with this idea of social realism in America, of using photographs as a way to highlight things that were going on in society. And during this time, one of those issues was immigration and so many people coming over from Europe to escape the carnage there of the world wars, of the nationalism, and a lot of them were turned away too. So let's take a look at the steerage, which is believed to be the first truly modern photograph. We're in the LACMA Study Center for Photography and Works on Paper, looking at probably one of the most important photographs of the 20th century, The Steerage by Alfred Stieglitz. He came upon this image on a trip with his wife and daughter. They were not coming to America, but rather going to Europe. They were lucky enough to be in first class. This image is of the steerage, where the cheapest seats would be. So these are not, as it's often perceived, immigrants coming to America, but actually Europeans some rejected at Ellis Island, some who came just on a worker visa. This has come to symbolize the experience of immigrants at the beginning of the 20th century, and even the figure wearing a shawl has been understood as a Jewish figure wearing a prayer shawl. None of that is true. Analyzing a photograph has many other layers, perhaps, than traditional painting, where you know that that image came from the artist's mind. So this image, in the same way, came from the artist's mind. There's some ambivalence, I think, on his part about where he fit in this situation scenario as a first-generation German-Jewish-American. So at the bottom of the image, we see the steerage above an observation deck that includes all types of people. And it's clear from Stieglitz's later writings that he did feel somewhat ambivalent about traveling first class. He didn't grow up in circumstances that would have allowed him normally to travel that way and seemed to have felt stifled by it and left that part of the ship to seek out different kinds of people in different circumstances. We do have this sense of this modern world of people of all types coming together, of movement, of immigration. And yet, when Stieglitz talked about this image, he tended to emphasize the formal aspects of the photograph, the relationship of the shapes and lines to one another, and not the subject matter, the very thing that has drawn so many of us to it. That goes to to his role as one of the fathers of photography. He really put this image out there. He was the one who was successful in making it appear in numerous magazines beyond its first iteration in his own journal, Camera Work. This was a very influential photography journal pushing forward the doctrine that photography could be fine art. Stieglitz himself said that if all my photographs were lost and I'd be represented by just one, the steerage, I'd be satisfied. So what is it about this that meant so much to Stieglitz, who had such a long and important career? It was a turning point for him from pictorialist photography into modern photography. Pictorialism was a term that was used by photographers practicing at the same time who wanted their work to be accepted as fine art, but leaned on painting and drawing. Photographers were trying to blur the edges, have wonderful additional toning, so that it looked like everything other than a photograph. Stieglitz is ready to move on and to embrace all the inherent 
wonderfulness that comes through the camera. By having a mechanical tool as your device, photographers were for a long time not considered fine artists. Modern life being characterized by the machine and not turning away from that but embracing it. This is not a direct quote but he would have said that the camera was the device to be used to document modern life. Stieglitz was especially interested in that oval shape of the straw hat that directs you, but you start to see that geometric shape repeat, and then you start to see other geometric shapes repeat. It's satisfying for the eye, but it simultaneously does represent the swirl of modern life. Everything's moving faster. People are going back and forth from one continent to another regularly enough that we have something called the steerage, and the pace of life is different. So the pacing within a composition changes too. It's important to remember that he saw this, recognized it, it as a compelling composition that said something that he wanted to say. Went to his cabin, got the camera, came back, and took this photo. His heart just beat faster, hoping when he came back that the specific start point in the composition the straw hat at the upper deck was still going to be in place. This is such an important photograph in the history of American photography, and it's no surprise that contemporary artists look back to it and do their own versions of it. One of those photographers who's tackled this iconic image is Vic Muniz. Started his career reappropriating existing imagery and making us look at it anew. He would work with materials such as dirt, dust, gold. And here, chocolate sauce. Which can represent the darks and the lights of photography. And so he's doing this as performance, remaking this work in an odd medium, and then photographing. Muniz is doing that kind of tongue-in-cheek, but also to point out the fact that photography has inherent mutability. The truths that are in photographs can constantly be questioned. Okay, so this piece that I, I just, I really think this is a powerful photo, um, and I do think it's, it's good for the 250 to pick this. Um, so when we talk about steerage, again, you're talking about if you've ever seen Titanic, like Jack was in steerage, like steerage is the third class passengers um, who had tried to, in, in this case, they had tried to immigrate to America from Germany, knowing the chaos that was coming there. And because America was the land of opportunity, but they were turned away. And so he talks about this repeating of geometric shapes and that circular white hat that he just had to get back and get that image because it's these different levels. And you can see it's almost got that cubist look to it because the people on the bottom seem closer to us, which in a way is true because these were the the true people. Like these were the salt of the earth, the immigrants, and then you have the higher upper class at the, the top and they're separated by that line. So it's almost like the entire picture is, the composition is divided by that line that actually exists in society of that ramp of the ones who are up at the top and the people who are at the bottom. It's almost like a collage with different things that kind of, come out at it so it's got really that cubist kind of feel to it but he it was art because of where he stood to take that picture with the way the light was reflecting it wasn't the how he developed it it was more so because of how he took it right and where he was standing and you can see that it almost tells different stories all at the same time and he's going to be a huge influence um, on other photographers who see the power of full impact of using images as a way to convey a social issue. For example, this is Migrant Mother by Dorothea Lange during the Dust Bowl. And that woman in that picture is in her early 30s. So you're talking about somebody who's younger than I am. Um, and she looks so much older and her face and worry are framed by her two children. And it's how the picture was taken, not how it was developed or manipulated that it was so powerful. So. We're talking about Albert, um, Alfred Stieglitz in 1907, and then by 1918, World War I is over, and the world is completely and totally shocked um, to their core as far as what had happened. Nobody had expected a war this big on this big of scale, and people were affected psychologically by it, including artists. And there were art movements that developed in a direct response to the chaos of World War I, that if World War I was supposed to make sense, and it was civilized, then they wanna do what does not make sense or what is civilized, or they wanna to try to regain some control 
in a world where clearly they didn't, all right? And the movement that is a direct representation of that is the steel, right? Which actually means the style, right? And for something so simple, it actually has a very, very deep meaning of finding balance, all right? So it actually is also kind of a reflection of that Bauhaus style and that Bauhaus minimalism of having as little as possible and De Steel kind of like played off of each other because you'll see Bauhaus homes and buildings that have De Steel kind of aesthetic or decoration to this. So you have Piet Mondrian, right, who is the artist that everybody knows with De Steel. And the idea in this is harmony and balance, all right? So with De Steel, it is completely abstract. It doesn't represent any kind of object at all. And you never see diagonal lines because diagonal lines could be sliding towards something bad. It could be not being able to hold on. These guys wanted a world they could hold on to that was balanced and that made sense and that was simple back before the war started. Straight lines, geometric shapes, balance. So for example, this one that you're looking at has more colors on the left, but it has more lines on the right. The blue at the top is balanced by the blue at the bottom. Three colors, red, yellow, and blue. That's it. No greens, no purples, just black lines, metric shapes, and no diagonal lines. None. All right. So De Steel is very easy to pick out. Um, and colors in this case are used kind of like the Fauvist in balance, right? And order and kind of just directly responding to what had happened during World War I to be like, Nope, we want control, we want order, we want simple, no diagonals, nothing out of control. And you can see that it kind of took hold in everything. It became a design aesthetic, people did cakes in it, um, home decor, kind of with that Bauhaus look to it, it was everywhere, all right? Then we go from De Steel, which makes perfect sense, to Dadaism, which makes absolutely no sense, all right? so. There's this, this, the way I explain Dadaism to kids or to, to my students is the fact that my babies, the very first word that they said, both of them, was Dada. And my husband was all excited about it. Dad, you know, cool. But the thing is, the D sound is actually the easiest one for babies to make. Mom, 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 mom takes a little bit longer to master. So yeah, way to go, Dad. He, they said Dada first, but it was nonsense because they didn't actually know what they were saying. It had no meaning mama when they said it that takes a little bit more they know exactly what they're saying all right so dada is like baby talk like babble it's nonsense it doesn't make no sense and why do we have dadaism because these guys were like if war makes sense i don't want to see art that makes sense i that you guys say that you're all nationalistic and proud of your art and all this and blah 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 okay fine i'm going to give you something to not be proud of. I'm going to change art completely in terms of what it actually is. I'm going to show you guys how stupid you actually look, all right? It also was a way to engage people in a conversation that distracted them. Like, what is art, actually? What is it? Is it art? And actually kind of get people's minds off of what is going on. And it actually got its start when World War I was just starting to brew in New York at an armory show. So an armory was this old building where they used to store ammunition and weapons. Um, and the goal of this was to introduce European, European art to Americans to kind of go, hey, here's what's happening in Europe, America, if you want to see it. And for an artist to exhibit, all they had to do was pay six bucks and they were allowed to exhibit. Picasso exhibited, there were impressionists there. And then there's going to be Marcel Duchamp, all right? So this was going to be a group of artists, all right, that wanted to show America that the art of Europe was not something to be afraid of. It was beautiful, it was inspirational, um, and it's good, and therefore it should be seen because American museums were a little bit persnickety about what they could show. So they're not showing this in a museum, they're showing it in an armory that they converted into a museum where people can come see modern art. So try to avoid the past and come see this modern style and maybe inspire 
some Europeans that the Americans can judge for themselves. All right, and this is something that actually came out of this. All right, so Mr. Richard Mutt, all right, so R. Mutt, all right, this is actually by Duchamp. All right, so this is an artist who's writing this, um, who's referring to himself as Mr. Mutt. And Mr. Mutt wasn't actually the artist. Duchamp was the artist, but he's giving credit to the owner of a plumbing store as the artist. All right, so hang on. They say any artist paying $6 may exhibit. All right, so this guy's like, I paid my six bucks. Richard Mutt, who is actually Duchamp, sent in a fountain. Without discussion, this article, meaning this item, disappeared and was never exhibited. Why did that happen to Mr. Mutt's fountain? Some people said it was vulgar and immoral. Others said it was plagiarism, that it was actually just a piece of plumbing, right? The argument that he wrote is Mr. Mutt's fountain is not immoral. That is absurd. No more than a bathtub is immoral. It is a fixture you see every day in plumber's show, show windows. Whether Mr. Mutt with his own hands made the fountain or not has no importance. He chose it. He took an ordinary article of life, a fountain, placed it so that its useful significance disappeared under the new title and created a new thought for that object. Okay. This is the fountain that he's referring to. This was actually entered into the Armory show by Marcel Duchamp, okay? And he called it fountain. It's actually a urinal that would have been in a men's bathroom. And he turned it upside down and said, okay, now it can't be a urinal anymore because I've turned it upside down. He put our mutt and the year on the outside of this, right? And then he said... R. Mutt was actually the owner of the plumbing store, so technically it was his art as well. And he said, it's art because I say it's art. I changed the function of it completely, so it's art. And people thought he was insane. This was what Dadaists did. They were like, I'm going to change your mind of what art is. They specialized in ready-mades, taking a work of art that was an object already made, changing the object for it, or changing the purpose for it and leaving it there for people to look at. And people said, this is not art. And he's like, yes, it is, all right? Teddy Roosevelt even said, that's not art, right? So a fountain being a urinal, and he's like, what? We've had tons of fountains in art. Go to Rome, there's all kinds of, the Trevi fountain and all kinds of fountains. He's like, this is a fountain. People are like, it's not a fountain, it's a urinal. So he turns it upside down and he's like, it's a fountain. There you go. I changed the function of it. I painted something on it. It's art. Okay. So what Dadaism is going to do is start to push artists to go, okay, well, if we can do stuff that's nonsense, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in my head that is nonsense. Do we have to use stuff that's actually realistic? And surrealists are like artists who go, you know what? I'm going to take it just a little bit farther. So we're going to stop here and we will talk about the surrealists in our next lecture.